I've set myself an impossible task, talking about six million years of human evolution in 18 minutes. However, having seen Franz Lanting last night talking about 3.5 million billion years and showing us the most amazing images of what happened through time, I think six, six million years is nothing. So now I'm feeling a bit happier. I joined the Leakey family by marrying um, one of Lewis and Mary's sons. Lewis and Mary really set the scene in East Africa for the discovery of human origins. Up until that time, nobody really believed that humans had their origins in Africa. Everybody thought that human origins were in Asia because of the well-known Java man and Peking man and all these things. But in 1959, Lewis and Mary discovered this fantastic skull and what was really exciting about it was that it, it actually said, this is where humans had their origins. And it had completely changed everybody's interpretation and ideas. And it was also the first time that volcanic ashes were used to date archaeological sites with the potassium argon technique. Lewis sent off a couple of samples to California. And the answer came back that this skull was 1.75 million years old. They'd expected something like 500,000 or 400,000. And so this was a real breakthrough that suddenly we have an ancient origin in Africa. I've always worked in northern Kenya in the Turkana Basin. It's huge. There are fossiliferous exposures extending up the east side of the lake, down the west, uh, down the east side, and in the north. And it covers at least uh, 2,000 square, square kilometers of, of very rich fossiliferous exposures. And it goes back in time, believe it or not, as far as the dinosaurs. But the, the time interval that's best re represented is the last six million years or seven million years when our ancestors evolved. And this is where um, we've been concentrating and where I began working um, with my husband, Richard. I married um, Lewis and Mary's middle son, Richard. And in spite of being told he was the last person I wanted to ever meet. <laughs> and, and we've worked together in the Turkana Basin for many years. And then in 1989, he took over the running of parks and started fighting poaching and that sort of thing. And I then took over the running of the expeditions. And our kids grew up in the field with us. And Richard believed that children should be seen and not heard and definitely pull their weight. And so they were occasionally given things like this enormous um, tortoise to excavate. <laughs> which they made a quite a good job of, I have to say. Louise now is a pilot, and she co-leads the expeditions with me. And she's also an explorer in res residence of the National Geographic. And the Geographic um, have supported leakage really since the discovery in 1959 of St. Anthropus and or, um, many expeditions as well in East Africa. So I think a lot of the credit for what we know about human origins actually goes to them. The Turkana Basin, as I say, is a place you have to visit. If you haven't been there, you haven't lived. It is absolutely amazing. And you get this um, fantastic feeling of continuity with the past. You see there, as far as I can see in all directions, are fossiliferous um, sediments. And the work there it will never end. It's just so much to do, so many sites to work, and so many fossils pouring out of the ground all the time. At the same time, on the east side of the lake, when we first went up there in, in 1968, 69, there was a wonderful array of wildlife. And it, it's stunningly beautiful. It's really incredible. And to recognize the wildlife and the prehistory, it was made a World Heritage Site and a national park. And so the east side of the lake is, is important for that reason. The west side's somewhat more different because it's inhabited by the Turkana people and there's not much wildlife left. This is the, an island in the middle of the lake uh, known as Central Island, and it's, it's testimony to the volcanic and tectonic forces that have shaped the lake basin over the millions of years. Um, the, you can see the beautiful volcanic craters. As I say, you get this sense of continuity with the past when you're there. The rivers flow into the lake, bringing in sediments. And so all the time, sediments are coming, burying the, any evidence of, of life living on the lake shore. And this is happening today as it always did in the past. And at the same time, you're getting constant erosion, and so we're getting new exposure of fossils. The way we find fossils is we have this wonderful team of local people who have very sharp eyes, and they just spend the day eyes glued to the ground, searching for little fragments, hoping that one of them will be something important. It's very hard to find evidence of our ancestors. 
you have to really look hard, and when they turn up, it's extraordinarily exciting. If we find something interesting, we then screen the surface, and that can take a lot of time. And that way, we, we pick up every single piece that might be associated with it. These days, we now use digital um, IT for um, recording our data, and this has made a big difference to our records. We're always having a few kids following us around because they're always intrigued by the, um, the things we're doing, and particularly the digital cameras because they can see themselves in the camera. So we have handheld computers, we have digital cameras, and of course GPS units. But what this means, and I really resent it, is that we tend to spend our evenings catching up with the day's data and downloading everything and getting ready for the next day. In the old days, we used to sit outside and look at the stars and contemplate who we are as a species and why we're there and what, what we're doing and, and it, think the important things. Now we just look at these stupid computer screens and I hate it. However, it's important. So I have obviously over 40 years of doing this work and people are always trying to find out why are humans unique? Why are they different? But in actual fact, if you compare humans with other animals and you start saying, oh, well, we have language, or we have technology, or we have this or that, bipedality, you can always find another species that does all these things. But the one thing in which we are absolutely and completely unique is that we are the only species that's destroying our environment, our life support system, the biosphere, the thing that keeps us here. And why are we doing it? And why don't we realize? And why don't we do something to stop it? So I think. Knowing about the past really helps us see, understand what's happening and think about the future. And so I think that, that the work that us and many other people are doing, trying to understand what's going on and to find fossils that show us about the past is really essential. Homo sapiens appeared only 195,000 years ago. We're very, very recent on this planet. And it's only in the last few years that we've really started um, doing the damage that we're doing today. So let's look at our past and see what went wrong. Basically, there are six key steps that led us to where we are today. And the first of these was bipedality. We will have a common ancestor with apes. And it's about between six and seven million years ago, genetic evidence tells us that this is when our two lineages separated. One went towards chimps and gorillas and bonobos, and the other to us. What, what caused the separation and why? And can we find some early ancestors that will tell us the details? And so I went to this wonderful site, Lothagham, which is incredibly fossiliferous, and it, the best sediments are between um, seven and five million years, which is absolutely right. So I was very confident that we'd find something really good. After five years, spending three months every year looking in this site, all we had to show for this was the two specimens you see there, this one and this one, which is a lower incisor and a molar, and a mandible that had been found by another expedition there earlier. However, the fauna that we were finding, the fossils that we were finding, were absolutely spectacular. These are two pig skulls, again, very complete, that gave us in information. But what was interesting was that we discovered that what we were finding was the last appearance of many of the animals that were living in East Africa in earlier times. And we will also find the first appearance of animals that are direct ancestors of the animals you see in the game parks today. So there was a major faunal change. And what's more is that the animals that were dying out were dominantly browsing animals feeding on leaves. The animals that were coming in, the new species, were dominantly grazers. And so there was a major change in vegetation. And I think that this change in vegetation was hugely important for setting the scene for humans to move out into the open country. The next step is manual dexterity. And of course, if you walk on two legs, you free your hands. And that means that you can then do other things with your hands. And some of the most important things that we do is feeding. And there is strong selective pressure for us um, feeding. These gelada baboons spend a lot of the year picking up tiny grass seeds. They have some of the most manually dexterous hands of any, of any primate. Um, chimpanzees' fingers, as you can see there, are long, they're curved, and they're not very good at doing tiny tasks. Our hands, we have an opposable grip, and we can do all sorts of things with our hands, which today is essential for, for all our technology. That's the next step, technology. We signed the first evidence that humans use tools. At, um, it's recently published, actually, at 3.4 million years. And some bones with cut marks and percussion marks have been found, which have been interpreted to show that humans were using tools at that age. The first actual tools don't appear until 
six million years, much later. But this was a major step because what it did was enable us, our ancestors, to eat meat. Meat provides a high calorie diet. And so at that point, our ancestors moved much more to a predatory niche and a meat eating niche. And this allows, of course, an increase in brain size because brains are expensive organs. They need a lot of um, high calorie food and meat provides it. We started finding evidence of, of human ancestors with enlarged brains in the early days when we started working at Sakana. This particular specimen, I had the challenge of putting all the pieces together, and it came in piece by piece from a site where it was eroding out of a hill. Another specimen here that you see was actually complete in situ but broken, and so as Richard excavated it, I was able to stick it all together. And again, we had another slightly larger brained um, individual. This one, um, which Richard's excavating here, is a Homo erectus skull that was very badly damaged because of the tiny grass roots that was penetrating the bone. When he finally um, extracted it after three days of slow excavation, we had this beautiful Homo erectus skull, which was the most complete at that time. This is Dr. Alan Walker, one of the leading anthropologists in the field, and he's cleaning the bones and reconstructing them, and then he, he started a big study with many colleagues. But this is what we had at the end, a complete skeleton of Homo erectus. The brain size turned out to be 65% of modern humans, so it's halfway between an ape and a human. And what this means is that we have a much longer um, and different life history to apes. And what we found from this um, skeleton was that Homo erectus, again, was halfway before, between us. The key with our childhood is that we have an extended childhood in which we can learn many things. And today, I think we really have to make use of this and educate our children to understand what we're doing to the world. Homo erectus was the first species to move out of Africa. We start finding evidence of Homo erectus at Dominici in Georgia and then in China and Java 1.8 million years ago. 600,000 years ago, we start seeing evidence of skulls that look more like us. Um, this one on the left is from Turkana. But it's not until 195,000 years ago that you find Homo sapiens. And this is Richard with a skull that he discovered in 1967, and it is the oldest Homo sapiens. But again, it wasn't until 65,000 years that Homo sapiens moved out of Africa. It turns out the genetic evidence gives us the path that Homo, Homo sapiens followed and also shows us that we evolved, all of us today, from this population 200,000 um, people strong. That's all. So it was a real bottleneck, and very nearly we became extinct at that time. So Homo sapiens moved around the world, um, Australia and Europe first, 50,000 years ago, then to North America only less than 20,000 years ago. Um, linguistic studies have shown that, the, that language um, followed a similar pattern to the genetics, and so it's believed that language really developed as we know it today in that same time that Homo erectus moved out of, of Africa. Language gives us collective intelligence, and this is crucial to what we do today. Language allows us to share intelligence, share our knowledge, and we don't reinvent the wheel every generation. We, we can pass on that knowledge and develop it, and individuals have different talents, and we can combine all this knowledge, which is hugely important for what we do today. But when things really started to go wrong, I think, was when we started domesticating and then growing crops. And this meant that we could settle down, we had a secure food supply, but it also meant that our population began to increase. And what we find is that basically there's not much change in population until very, very, very recently. In 1776, when America was born, there were one billion people in the world. When I was born in 1942, there were 2.3. That's fine, the world can cope with that. Today, we're nearly 6.7 billion. And that's too many, and we're, it's projected to go over nine um, by 2050, which is far too many. The fifth extinction was caused by a, a big asteroid his, hitting the Earth. The sixth extinction, which is going on now, is driven by us. And we have to do something about this. What we're trying to do at Takana is to develop a couple of research centers, well, a research institute with centers in the, in the field where we can um, facilitate research because there's so much that needs to be done there. And it is really essential that we find out more about our beginnings. The, these two um, research centers, this is the one on the west side, which is almost complete and is functioning. And the one on the east side, we're going to start building. This is just temporary um, next year. We have local people involved finding the fossils, cleaning the fossils, and then doing the curation. So they're 
totally involved in the whole process and they understand that this is their heritage and, and this is really important. We have international meetings. This is the last one we had this last summer when scientists come and, and discuss their discoveries. We have an active mobile clinic. Um, this is Peter Sylvester handing out mosquito nets that have been donated. And the mobile clinic goes around with an immunization program that reaches remote areas that have never seen doctors and also teaches women reproductive health. We also have a conservation program to show the kids. Uh, we take them to fossil sites, have them find their own fossils, do their own sieving, and be aware of what we're doing. So on the bigger picture, what do we do? As a species, what do we do? How do we, how do we stop this terrible trend um, with us becoming the most deadly species that ever existed? I believe that uh, modern technology and all our attributes can combine to do, to, to do something about it. And I think there's many positive things going on at, at right now, and you hear them here at TED. But I think that the internet is really key, and particularly with children, because we should use that extended childhood to teach our children what is happening and what's going on, and that they must do something about it. If we even get 50% of the kids to understand what's going on, in less than 20 years, you have a big body of adults who are really committed to doing something and, and um, changing things. And so I think we have to use all our attributes, our language and our technology and everything, to make sure that we continue as a species. We live on this one tiny planet. Um, it's not, it has this thin film of life around it which sustains life. We have to preserve that. We have a common origin in Africa. We're one species. We are there, here, and we have to work together, and that's important. So let us not <laughs> join our ancestors in extinction. Let us go forward as one of the most extraordinary species that ever lived and one of the most positive species that ever lived on this earth. Thank you very much.